just waiting to go live and uh, that's probably the sound to go live i think um oh uh, yeah I mean, we, uh, we we are live right now aren't we it, it doesn't we say that live. yes yeah. we are live so welcome to our very first live stream we will have a lot of things to go through today but uh i'm sure you guys will be edified uh in this session and um yes so today is saturday from where i am uh we are in melbourne australia now it's 15 degrees celsius up to you to convert that to fahrenheit it's a bit low for fahrenheit but um it's i think it is fitting for us to introduce uh ourselves especially this is my first live stream i want to introduce myself as well and then we'll go through to each of the panel here as you can see the publicist tyler and Disciple Mike, every one of us can uh, go through, uh, introduce yourselves a bit. Okay, so let me start with myself. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I run this channel and uh, I was born and raised in Malaysia. Now I'm residing in Australia to do my PhD in engineering. And I have a wife and a kid. Uh, the kid is 25 days old now, so pretty fresh, fresh like Disciple Mike as he's going to introduce himself as well. Um, in terms of ministry, I do Bible studies spe specifically to international students. Um, and sometimes on the streets, before lockdown, before COVID, I usually talk to find, no, actually Jehovah's Witnesses uh, speak to me on the streets, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons as well. So uh, I get a bit of uh, conversations uh, face to face there but uh, now with lockdown we don't see that anymore uh, and because of that we still have online to reach out to more people uh, but anyway that's enough for me uh, why not Tyler give us a short introduction of yourself please well uh, not much to say I'm just a random person on YouTube who uh, likes to argue with uh, people about Christianity uh, I do it because uh you know, I, I try as hard as I can to convince people that the that, that Christianity is the one true religion, and uh, it, it's uh, I guess uh, I've had a, a little bit of an influence uh, on some people's uh, opinions. Uh, I've seen some people have uh, turned, have changed their mind, and uh, that's good, and uh, that that's about it. Thanks, Tyler. This is that's it. Oh yeah about myself i'm publicist i just run my own youtube channel doing christian apologetics and uh, i just engage in topics related to trinity time to time islam and and also like being a catholic secondary focus of my channel has also got to do with defending the catholic faith so that's me in a nutshell thank you and our very own our guest here disciple mike why don't you give a introduction yourself yeah yeah first off thanks so much for having me jeremy um i think one of the most important things that we can do as human beings is is um engage in apologetics for christianity the one truth and the true way to god um unfortunately we look around and we see a lot of different ways to to go about doing so and unfortunately, there's a lot of contradiction, a lot of contradictory ways of doing so. I was born and raised into the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses and was really believed it was the only truth um, about till I was about 23. So maybe five years ago or so before I started challenging those doctrines and soon then changed my Christology, even though I was still in the organization, changed my Christology to more of a biblical Unitarian um, mindset. And that's when I started professing that and arguing for it on YouTube. Um, so for quite some time, for the last five years or so, um, even though while remaining in the organization for various reasons, I was a Unitarian up until about two weeks ago, give or take, to where I have finally 
seeing the light, the true, the true message of scripture, which tells us to confess that Jesus Christ is God. And now I fervently believe in the Trinity and am currently undergoing the catechism to join the, the Catholic faith. Wow, that's a big conversion there from, I guess, from not just from Unitarian to Trinitarian. It's also from anti-Catholic to Catholic as well. Yes, yeah. very, very much anti-Catholic. Yeah, too Catholic. Yeah. Um, when do you convert to, uh, to become a Trinitarian? Um, not very long ago. Yeah. Probably about two weeks ago. Yeah. Two weeks ago, maybe three, right? Yeah. And just to show you guys, uh, we, we've the panel knows, but we've compiled a few comments that Mike has made uh, three weeks ago, and that at that time he was still objecting against the Trinity. Um, if I would share the screen here, he's over here. Mike is uh, discussing with Tyler uh, on the YouTube uh, comment section. I'm not sure which video that is. Uh, I think they're discussing on who is called God, why why uh, someone else is called God other than God himself. And then uh, disciple Mike here, he says, oh, David is the king of Israel. God is king of Israel, therefore David is God. Uh, I guess it's just, you know, uh, an objection to the Trinity. Another one here. This one is obviously from this from this video here. And then disciples Mike comments right, right on the right side uh, over here. And I think he was discussing about, this was three weeks ago, so I, I took the screenshot just yesterday. Um, this was, um, I think he's discussing about, um, what's he discussing about? It's a bit long here. It's, uh, yeah. so I think it's in, um, he brings up mm -hmm. a passage in Titus, Titus 2.13, I think, yeah. where it says, okay. we wait our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah, okay, and then you're objecting to it. Anyone who wants to see it, you can just pause and then see what is. It's not important anymore because this is just to show you guys he he was a Unitarian, a diehard Unitarian just three weeks ago and just when my baby boy was born. So maybe that's a simple <laughs> sign there as well. New life. Uh, yeah. New life, yeah. Born again. You're born again today. My, uh, this was two weeks ago. I think it was three weeks ago as well. Uh, YouTube doesn't update the, the weeks properly. Um, and then he's just amending a, a Unitarian sister, a Unitarian lady here. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, you know, back up their white Jesus and their three person <laughs> pagan God. And then he says, amen. <laughs> I don't think I saw that last part. I think I was just saying it the first part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's why you need to read. All right. I think yep. there's one more. Hopefully it's a bit long as well. This was a discussion about the name Elohim. Why is it plural? And just to give you a hit, uh, just a short summary, he said Elohim is, is Elohim because God is the God of gods. Um, I don't know where he get that from. Um, it's a bit weird. So not, on, not only Disciple Mike was a Unitarian, not only he was an anti-Catholic, but he was also a Greek scholar and a Hebrew <laughs> scholar as well. And then I stopped doing that. Yeah. And then you stopped <laughs> and, and you forgot your Greek as well. I forgot it all, yeah. All right, so, so this just to prove to you guys, he is a fresh Unitarian. So he's the one uh, to talk about uh, when it comes to objections to the Trinity. All right, so uh, why don't I start with a short prayer and then we'll just get going. Right. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for bringing all of us here today. We thank you for uh, technology. We thank you for internet that we can converse even though we are from two different time zones, two opposite time zones, and two different locations as well, Lord. And Lord, we pray that your spirit will be with us as we discuss uh, common objections to your uh, being, uh, to the Trinity, Lord. Uh, we pray that you put words in our mouth as we go through each of them. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so we have a few, we have nine people in the chat. Just want to say hello, Iwa, Iwa, Dragon, Daenerys, XYZ, XYZ, Sergeant Grinch, Ben Yusuf, and Biblicis is here. Uh, ben Beals is here as well. 
I think I can't I can't pronounce your name. Sorry, but uh, I think your name is Debit, right? You have an Arabic name. I'm sorry. All right, so let's go through these common objections to the Trinity. Um, the way I'm gonna we are gonna do this is um, we're gonna put it on the slide, and then Mike gonna Mike is gonna clarify whatever that needs to be clarified, and then God willing, we'll we'll refute that. All right. Um, just off the bat, this is not a Tara. Um, we will not give we will not give a Tara refutation to each of the points. Uh, this is just to make you anticipate what uh, Unitarians will come up with, so that you yourself can come up with your own arguments. Um, and God willing, that that those arguments will be biblical as well. All right, but we'll 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 give our few cents, maybe more than a few cents uh, for each point. All right, depending on how excited we are uh, to discuss though. All right, so number one, the first, uh, the, the go-to passage to Unitarians, for Unitarians is John 17, verse 3. And I'm going to read it. That's from the New King James Version. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I like to call this the Unitarian Shahada, if you have... Uh, seen if you know a bit about uh, Islam. This is like the Unitarian Shahada. <laughs> That's why I like call it. But uh, you know, it's 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 uh yeah. So Mike, would you like to clarify a little bit? Yep. So so the idea with this verse is to be is to try to make it clear that there are two distinct individuals being spoken about. So and you have to know both of them to gain everlasting life or eternal life. So it says, and this is Jesus speaking in a prayer. He says, this is eternal life that they may know, that they may know you, Father, the only true God. Um, exclamation point on that. The only one that is truly God is, you know. And as well as or in addition to Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So that's the that's the mindset of going into the scripture that there are two who we need to have, profess our faith in the Father, who is the only true God, in addition to Jesus Christ, the one whom the only true God sent. That's kind of the mindset of of the Unitarian. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that. So um, just right off the bat here, um, this is totally. Uh, Trinitarian. This is sound Trinitarian verse, um, although the context won't won't help the Unitarians. But let's just stick to it because they like to stick to one verse. Um, anyone like to object to this? Does anyone like to do that? Also, oh, I can start. Oh, Tyler, let's go. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I was gonna say, should we like have it to where like one goes first and then the other? Or... Yeah, sure. Um, maybe let's let's do a. Uh, uh, Let's do a. We, we'll take turns, right? Maybe if we don't have any comments, we'll we'll just give you, right? Um, so Tyler, you can go first, and then Biblicist, then me, then the next one I'll go first, then Biblicist, then maybe Mike, and then Tyler. Right. Okay, so we'll sounds do good. A reverse section. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, what I would say is this verse does not say that only the Father is God. It says the Father is the only God. The thing is, we Christians believe in only one God. We don't believe in multiple gods. So if it said that, that the Father wasn't the only God, that would be polytheism. And uh, see, Unitarians will argue that this excludes uh, the Son. They'll say, oh, the Father is the only God, therefore the Son cannot be. But you can look at Matthew 23, 10. It says, Jesus is our only master. Does that mean the Father is not our master? According to their logic, that's exactly what that means. And uh, that's uh, my response to that. Mm. Matthew 23, 10 says uh, in the New King James, and do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. We're going to go through this passage as well later. Uh, but yeah, there's only one teacher. Is that true? Not mm. really, right? Well, I mean, I mean, the Father and the Son are, are one. So like, you know, they're... Yeah one teacher you know you could say because they're one god yeah yeah thanks tyler um biblicis so like just looking at the passage in its immediate context if you'll just start from 
verse number one. I mean, John 17, the entire thing. Uh, Jeremy, you might have to zoom it to close to 200% because uh, there are people who just, you know, look on their phones. That's the feedback I get. So I have to end up zooming it a bit more. Thanks for that. Is it more? Is it good? Okay. Yep. So, so in the first verse, here. yeah. Jesus mm -hmm. says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to, to all whom you have given him. Okay, now just read verse 1 why is jesus asking god to glorify him who am i as a mortal man asking the one god to glorify me and if god glorifies me then the son will glorify you mm -hmm. why is that then yeah, this is not a mere mortal it, it can't be a mere mortal otherwise for a mere mortal to speak this this is just downright say blasphemy or arrogance then mm -hmm. he just goes on to say, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So if we go to John 5, uh, I think specifically verse 19 onwards, John 5, again, the same gospel, mm -hmm. verse 19, roughly 19 onwards or yeah we could just take the chapter and yep. Me too. here we go we just need to zoom in a bit uh that this doesn't help <laughs> oh yeah so now if like verse 17 onwards like jesus they are saying that they broke that jesus broke the sabbath and also said that god was his father making himself equal with god now over here take note that even the jews used to consider god as their father but jesus considered himself god as his father in a very unique sense in a way that he's equal to god by also claiming that I uh, my, my father has been working, I have been working. In other Matthew and Mark and parallels, Jesus just says that I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So now if I'm going to verse 19, now this is important, considering the resurrection of the dead. Um, this does verse 19, to, I think you'll have to go all the way to 24 if I'm not, okay. Sorry, it's that, it's that, sorry. My bad. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus and answered, then Jesus answered and said to the Jews, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but he sees the father do for whatever he does. The son also does in like manner. Now, over here, Jesus is saying that I can only do what God can do. Now, for a human being to claim this, this is arrogance, it can be blasphemy. Uh, or you could say that Jesus is a madman or some kind of a liar. Mm -hmm. Now, if you read on, he's saying, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Okay. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Now, again, like in the context of John 17, 1 to 2, Jesus is saying that the Father can give eternal life. Over here, over here, Jesus is saying that even the Son, that is he himself, can give eternal life. Okay? So, that's that objection. So, if you're going back to John 5, verse yep. 22 now, yep. verse 22, this one also destroys them. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Now, if you guys are going to the Old Testament, the Old Testament, uh, I think it's Psalm 98. Just go to Psalm 98 and Psalm 96 concerning like, I mean, these are two of the Psalms. There is more, but it talks about God being judge of the world. 96 and 98. 
Yeah. And I think it's the last verses, but I can't remember the verse numbers. I know it's in 96 and 98. You'll just have to... Okay. Yeah, just scroll down. Just trying to pick out it's among the later verses, if my so memory 96. doesn't fail me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So verse 13 says mm -hmm. in 96, for he is coming. If you're reading the psalm, the context is the Lord, Jehovah. Jehovah is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with truth. On the mm -hmm. right hand side, you see Psalm 98. Again, he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in truth. Okay? Peoples with equity. Before the yeah. Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Now, if I'm going to John 5, Jesus says that now from here, from 96 and 98, we can establish that God is going to judge the earth. But in John 5, Jesus makes it clear that it's not God the Father, but him, God mm -hmm. the Son, who is going to judge the earth. So that's kind of established, and I guess that in context with John 17, 1 to 3, that throws that Unitarian objection out of the window. Any further thoughts to this, guys? Yes, so I'm going to give back, give them back a, a counter verse, which shows... Uh, oh, thanks for that, uh, Bipasis. I'm going to give them a counter verse to show that not only that the Father is the only true God, but the Son is as well the only true God. But, uh, you know, they'll say, you know, this is not translated properly. The pronouns is going towards the Father. But, uh, I mean, just read it, right? See where the pronouns is coming from, right? Let's see from the New King James Version. Let me zoom in a little bit more for those who are viewing from your phones. First John 5, 20 says, And we know that the Son of God, right, Jesus, has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in him, right? Him is still to Jesus, who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. This, right? This is still talking about the son. The subject is still the son. This is the true God and eternal life, right? Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, they will say that this means the father. But uh, I mean, if you just read it properly, if you fo follow the subject, we will yeah. see that the son is also the only true God. Yep. How about the Holy Spirit? We'll get to that uh, later on. God yep. willing, right? Are we going to touch on First John five twenty later too, or no? Uh, no. But do you, do you have any comments on First John five twenty? Yeah. So yeah, the way that I've that I've looked into it, and quite a few scholars take it this way too. I'm not sure what the church fathers have to say, but basically, and this is a good way to link John seventeen three, because it's speaking about the work that Jesus is doing and that he's accomplishing until it's finally uh, fulfilled at the passion and on the cross where he says it has been accomplished. And this work basically is the revealing to mankind, the only true God through Jesus Christ. So, I mean, I could, you, you can look at a couple of different verses to back that first Corinthians 13, 12, first John three, two, and it's an opposition to fictitious deities that were surrounding the nations, but it does not include the sun, but rather the idea is it is inconceivable to have one without the other, to have the father without the son, to have the son without the father. That's why John repeatedly always has the two together. And so, for example, in this verse, 1 John 5.20, where it says, this is the true God and eternal life. The true God is the Father and Son together with the Holy Spirit or known through by the Holy Spirit. The true God is a Father who loves his Son through the Holy Spirit. Um, that is the true God. Uh, so that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And the biblicists have shown as well from the context of the book of John. And we're still John, by the way, if you believe John, John wrote first John. We're still in John, right? Um, we didn't jump too many verses here. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, John doesn't exclude the Son as the only true God, right? Right. Because right. he says, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father. You have to have both. You cannot have one without the other. That's the idea that John, specifically John, keeps saying over and over and over. Yes, yes. Amen. 
All right, let's go to the next one. Ho hopefully that's uh, thorough enough. Um, yeah. But the next one, singular pronouns of God. All right, this uh, this verse here, I took it. I took from Taylor's debate with Anthony. That's his first um, first verse that he showed, and he said he he used this verse. Right, he says, "I am the Lord." I mean, the verse says, "I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, and though you have not known me, he says, "I am" is a singular noun. Me is a singular pronoun. And therefore, if singular pronouns used for God, therefore God is unipersonal. Um, I guess I'll start from this one. Well, well, if you want to say singular pronouns means singular person, you're actually contradicting the Bible. Let me give you one uh, example here, Genesis 28. It's regarding uh, Jacob's, the story of Jacob's letter, right? Um, some of you might know this quite well. Let me zoom in. In verse 14. All right, so God is speaking to Jacob. Jacob is alive at this time, okay? In verse 14, God says to... Uh, let me start from 13, right? And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord Jehovah, God of Abraham, your father, and then the God of Isaac, the land which... You lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. All right? Listen to this. This is singular. All right? And I can prove it in Bible Hub if you want to, want to see. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your sea, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, if singular pronouns means singular person, um, did Jacob go from east to the west, north to the south? Not really, right? It's his descendants, right? Even though there is a singular pronoun here, uh, doesn't mean that Jacob is the one who went east and the west, right? It's his descendants, this is descendants of Israel, right? So right off the bat, I mean, singular pronouns, I can give more examples to this, but uh, singular pronouns doesn't mean um, singular person. Right, and I, if, if I want to change the King James, the King James captures it quite well. Uh, let me change to the King James real quick. If I know my alphabets, it should be here. King James. All right, so for you guys who don't know, uh, know the King James language that well, Dao is singular. D, singular, U, Yi is plural, right? So let's go back to verse 14 again. Look at that. In thy seed, right? In your seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou and you, singular you, shall spread abroad from the west to the east, to the north and to the south. In thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed, right? So Jacob, singular, Jacob, pronoun to him, doesn't mean singular person. Uh, Biblicist, why not? Do you have anything to add to it? Add to this singular pronoun? Uh, for God? Nothing at much at this stage, but uh, you could just say in certain places, like say Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 30, verses yep. 1 to 4. Yep. Uh, it's actually, uh, yeah, just go to Proverbs 30, verses 1 to 4. Considering this, nor of the knowledge of the Holy One. Okay, specifically verse three. It's actually, I neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the Holy Ones. If you are going to look at the interlinear, it's actually plural. It's ma. It's plural, because the very next line is talking about the Son. The very next verse, verse 30, verse, Proverbs 30, verse 4. So it could be a lack here, yeah? Proverbs 30, 34? Yeah, 30, 30 verse, verse 3, 4. you could just go to, yeah, let's go to verse 3, Proverbs 30, verse 3. Verse 3, yeah? Yep. Um, uh, something wrong. loading up, is it, is it your computer? Yeah, sorry guys. 
bit old. That's fine. Good. We'll just have to zoom in a bit for the benefit yep. of the audience. Kadoshim. We'll have to zoom in a bit more. Yep. yep. Yeah. Scroll down. And what does it read there for Kadoshim? Kedoshim below that is adjective masculine plural. Plural and it's seem I am whenever you see Hebrew words ending with I am, it's talking about them in the plural. It's signifying mm -hmm. plurality. Because now if you're reading the very next verse, Proverbs 30, verse 4. Yep. Oh, I was gonna refresh the page again. Sorry, sorry about that, guys. I gotta get used to this. Maybe some of you can uh uh Biblicist, you can, you know, help me out. What what yeah, software do you sure. use? <laughs> I don't. I'm just using Chrome right now. At the okay. moment. Okay. I think Chrome will, will fix it, right? Sorry about that. All right, verse That's four. Okay. Yeah, verse four. I mean, just better to read it in the English. I mean, uh, in your Bible gateway. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Because over here in the interlinear, it's a bit up and down. You can just drop the link for people's benefits in the chat. Wait, I'll do that. You can just take care of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oops, 30. Oops, 30. Let's see. You see it, BBC? Uh, uh, you'll have to make me a mod because I can't get that link to work. Uh, that, that's okay. You can put the link later. Sure. When, when yeah, I, I can see it. Speak. So if you're going on to read verse 4, who has ascended up into heaven or a descendant, who has mm -hmm. gathered the wind in his fist, who has bound the waters in a garment, who has established all the ends of the earth, what is his name and what is his son's name if you can tell if you can't mm. tell so if mm. it just make making it very clear in the context nor have i knowledge of the holy one it's holy ones and yeah. then it's making it clear it's the father and the son yeah. who's done all these yeah. things so again it just shoots yeah. them in the foot i mean there's more um plural pronouns as well as we all know this, right? Genesis 126, let us make man in our own image. Um, uh, 11, 7, let us go down. Or Genesis 3, uh, behold, he he has become like one of us, right? Yep. I mean, those we, we have plural pronouns everywhere as well. And I'm sure the Unitarians will uh, butcher that. We'll say that he's talking to the angels. Um, and some Trinitarians will do that as well, which is not that helpful. It is um, not that helpful because if he, if he's talking to the angels, why is why are the angels co creating with him? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. In that sense, right, in Genesis one twenty six specifically. Yes, yes. All right, we're not we won't go to to that, but uh, that's a pretty normal verse to go to. Um. Anyway, uh, Tyler, do you have any more to add? Oh, you're muted. Okay. Uh. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, they, they made very good points. Uh, the fact is, in many verses, singular pronouns are used for more than one person. Uh, the only thing I would want to add is that it's ironic that most Unitarians will argue that the Holy Spirit is not a person. They'll say the Holy Spirit is just an impersonal force, even though singular pronouns are used for the Holy Spirit all the time. So if singular pronouns indicate a single person, then why don't they believe that, that the Holy Spirit is a person? You see, it's a, it's a kind, you know, they're, they're, they're not consistent with their logic. Yeah, uh, they, are, they are everywhere when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll, we might get through that to the Holy Spirit, uh, hopefully. But uh, just one more last point here, if we can see it's Bible Hub. Uh, just getting, getting up. We'll go to one verse, all right, not just two. Genesis 35, 35, 7. As I get it up, uh, Mike, do you have any more to add? Yeah, just these are all great points. I think one of there's there's two ways you can look at it. God is one being that exists in three persons. So it's okay to refer to God in the singular, but not, 
I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, we do that all the time in language as well. When speaking of a grouping of persons, Jeru uh, the city of Jerusalem is referred to in a singular pronoun. She does this, she does that. I will have vengeance on her, speaking of Jerusalem. So you see that, but on the flip side, you can have one person of the Trinity speaking at one time while the others aren't speaking. So it's just natural to, to say that it's, it's to use singular pronouns for them. Where the father speaks, you'll say, they'll, they'll use ver, uh, pronouns, singular personal pronouns for when the father speaks, he is speaking. So it's, it's not as problematic as a Unitarian tries to make it out to be. I think it's a little more deceptive or they try to, to force it into being a, more of an issue than it actually is. Yeah. yeah. And thanks, thanks, Mike. And over here, Genesis 35, 7, and there's another passage as well. We're not going to go to that. This one is concerning Jacob again. I love Jacob. Uh, but the word appeared here is not rendered well in the English, but in the Hebrew, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but you can see it in the Hebrew, it's a, the word appeared here is a plural right a plural okay it's not just and it's not just some generic god right god appeared to him the god who appeared to him you see the the definite article here ha elohim the god who appeared to him it's it's plural so if you want to translate it literally in english it's they appeared to him so that's a i mean that's a um plural verb here which in english will be translated as a plural pronoun right um so hopefully that the people who are watching is being uh edified right now we are only in our second point and just one more point on the father and then we'll go straight to jesus okay so next point is first timothy 2 5 for there is one god and one mediator between god and man the man christ jesus i emphasize the man a lot um but uh, Mike, what do you, is there any more to clarify from here? Yeah, again, this is similar to the John 17, 3. It's, it's seeing a distinction of person and then emphasizing that distinguishing and trying to use that as the argument. So here we see there is one God and one mediator between this God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So that's a go-to scripture. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I used that before when I was staunchly anti-Catholic as well. Mm. Um, but uh, I mean, reading the context, you know that you can actually help both both sides here. So, Tyler, uh, what what do you say about this? Well, I would say that this verse disproves the deity of Christ about as much as it disproves the humanity of Christ. You know, they say. Jesus cannot be God because he mediates between God and man. So according to that logic, he cannot be a man because he mediates between man and God. Uh, he, he, he's the mediator because he is both. Uh, the, the best mediator is uh, someone who can uh, you know, see the perspective of both sides. And Jesus is the perfect mediator because he's both God and man. Thanks for that. Um, very concise, Taylor. You, I think you can go for debates, right? Um, but uh, Biblicist, do you have any more to add? Um, nothing more to add to this, you guys. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I was just trying to give a buffer so I can get, get the verses up here. Um, let's see. Let's see if it works. My, my computer is so laggy. Sorry about that, guys. There we go. Okay, we, we've looked at this passage just now, Matthew 23. Um, and I'm emphasizing on the word one here, heist, right? One. We like to see one God, one man. So if Jesus, if the Father is the one God, there can't be more than one God, which is a, a straw man again. We don't believe in more yeah. than one God. Right. Um, so let's let's emphasize on the word one here. Okay, we, we've seen this before, Matthew 23. But you do not come, do not be called rabbi for one. Is your teacher the Christ, and you are all brethren? First of all, this is talking about the teacher, the Christ. Uh, so that does that mean the Father is not a teacher? But if we compare that to First Corinthians twelve, 
you see there's more than one teachers now and appointed these the church first apostles second prophets the teachers right it's plural after that miracles gifts of healing helps administration varieties of tongues are all apostles are all prophets are all teachers are all workers of miracles do we do all have gifts of healing do all speak with tongues do all interpret and let's see desire uh, the best gifts and yet i show you a more excellent way so here uh, although there's one passage that says there is one teacher but actually there is more teachers right and like i think what tyler said it's not it's not just one teacher it's the best teacher that's that's got right and the best mediator is jesus christ because he's at the right hand of the Father. all right yep right and the word highest as well is the it's not just numerical one right uh if some of you can confirm with me it's primary or first right but anyway uh john 10 16 this one is is quite good as well and other sheep i i have which are not of this fold them also i must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd oh only one shepherd uh i mean look in this world there's so many shepherds as well is jesus lying but let's let's say the bible doesn't contradict uh, itself let's say during that time there's only one shepherd i don't know if anyone think of that but let's go to x 2028 uh a go-to passage as well uh for us therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock all the flock right among which the holy spirit which has made you overseers to shepherd the church of god which he has purchased with his own blood right um I think the you there and yourselves are all uh, plural. So there's more than one shepherds of the church. And obviously, again, Jesus is the best shepherd, right? So let's go back to 1 Timothy, right? Let's see the context, right? I alluded to you guys as well. Well, if there's one mediator between God and man, look at what verse 1 says, all right? Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, I exhort first all of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So if there's one mediator, then why did Paul in verse 1 says you can intercede for other people as well? Is that is that right? Is that just one mediator? Not a numerical one, more like the best mediator. Right? Any more things to add to that, Mike? Um, no, these are all great points. I think, you know, the idea of what Tyler, I just, I guess to compound on what Tyler says. So we get to the father through Christ. We have a mediator, someone, someone who has experienced all that we have gone through. He's had, he's, he's lived a life, a full life as a human being who's experienced pain, who's experienced grief who's experienced all these things and he now he can intercede on our behalf to the father. So I think it's a beautiful thing um, that highlights the humanity of Jesus Christ, who he, he is still human. He's still a man that sits at the right hand of the father. Um, but it's not to take away from his nature of being God, how he is the being God. Um but it's yeah exactly what ta what Tyler said has said yeah good points all right let's, let's turn to it um, now we'll begin to talk about Jesus right this is a this is a philosophical question that uh, or statement that uh, Unitarians always pose to us as if you know this is not this is not biblical right it says they will usually say Jesus can't be one hundred percent God and one hundred percent man. And I had a Unitarian say, how can you be dumb and smart at the same time? Or fool, a cup can be full and empty at the same time. These are all philosophical questions, right? Well, this is a, a case of says you, right? Like I like to call that says, says who or says you, right? Only you can say, you say that you can't be that. Uh, but the Bible actually is, is um, you know, clear on that, right? We say 100% God, 100% man, because the Bible says it, right? And just to just to show that this question was asked by the unbelieving Jews as well. I, I'm going first and then Tyler can, can continue or Biblicist can continue on. Um, am I going first this time? I think it's okay. I'll, I'll just go first. Um, 
this this sounds like the question that the unbelieving Jews ask, right? Uh, John six forty two, right? After discussion of him being the bread that comes from heaven, that comes from the Father, right? And he comes from heaven. Uh, the Jews said, "Is this not is is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, right?" So they think that Jesus is just a man, right? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Even they ask the same question. Those are unbelieving Jews, by the way. And if you want to say they they just, um, you know, they uh, didn't understand what Jesus means, Jesus himself poses that contradiction to the Sadducees, to the unbelieving Sadducees in Mark chapter 12. A lot of Unitarians like to use Mark chapter 12, uh, which parallels Deuteronomy 6.4. But in the context in verse 37, uh, he just got done quoting Psalms 110. Um, and then he says, Therefore David calls him Lord. The Lord says to my Lord, See, I'm around till I make your enemies a footstool for uh, thy feet. Right? In verse 37, Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Right? It's a, it's a good question that Jesus posed to them. Right? Um and Jesus always asked rhetorical questions, right? But over here, we can see the Sadducees couldn't believe it, right? The Sadducees, uh, Jesus asked them, who do you think the Messiah is? He's the son of David, right? He's just a man, the son of David. But how then David calls him Lord, right? Now, um, I would like to go to Philippians, right? Philippians 2. This is a, this is a very, very... A uh, great passage to show the deity of Christ, that he is both man and God, all right? Look here in, in verse 5, I'll just read it to you guys. Let this be in, let this mind be in you, in which also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant. You see the two forms there? He's the form of God. And then now he's a form of a born servant coming in the likeness of man, right? If he's, if he didn't, I mean, if he's, if he's not God, how can he come in the likeness of man? All right. He just was just born. No other man will be called likeness of man, coming in the likeness of man. I'm sorry. And in verse eight, and being found in the, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. And therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. All right, now back to the uh, deity of Christ, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. All right, and this, this verse here uh, is parallel to Isaiah 45, which uh, our friend used, quote, verse 5, but in verse 23, Paul uses that, to Jesus, I've sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. All right, so this is these are just the passages to show that Jesus is 100% God, 100% man. And yeah, uh, Biblicist, why don't you, do you, do you okay. have any more things to add? No, yeah, just a couple of things yep. uh, on the... Uh, on Mark, if you'd go to Mark 12, 37, uh, actually you should start reading from Mark 12, 29 to 12, 37. Mark 12, 29 to 12, 37. So this, yeah, man, just zoom the screen because we have a couple of uh, people here. There's faithful servant serving and biblical corner. who have been having a ball of a time in the chat section. Okay. Hello. Good you brought up. Yeah, welcome these people. Okay, and I hope they are listening. So Jesus answered them. The first of all commandments is, this is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Okay, so now this is what a Unitarian will use. And this is also the same words which oneness modalists will use to prove their case. Okay or a oneness or whatever and you shall love the lord with lord your god with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind and with all your strength this is the first commandment 
And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Okay. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, we have spoken the truth. For there is one God and there is no one other but he. And to love him with all his heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor. Scroll down. Yeah, just scroll down because yeah, I can just see. Oh, it's okay, no worries. And to love one's neighbor as yourself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that, he answered wisely, he said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So these, so this is a passage which Unitarians and Oneness will quote, but the next verse just ref, refutes them. So if you go to 35 to 37, just scroll, scroll down. Then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit. So now you see the Trinity here. David is talking by the Holy Spirit who's inspiring him to talk. The Lord said to my Lord, David is prophesying. He can see the father saying to the son. He's calling them both lords. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. Then how is he then? How is the Messiah David's son? So this kind of like clearly differentiates the father and the son and also in that a trinity. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for going to Two the context. Lords. And, uh, and what were the other passages you had brought up? That was John 20, 28, right? Uh, no, I haven't brought that up yet. Sorry. You haven't brought that up. Okay, this is about Jesus being fully God and fully man. So I can um, see faithful servants, servant uh, serving is arguing that when Jesus was in heaven, he was the father. But when he came to earth, he was flesh. But I don't know what she's saying. And she's just contradicting herself, saying he was like a man or was it the other guy? So just go to John 20. Okay, yeah, see. Gnosticism. This is okay. downright Gnosticism. So just yep. go to John. Um, wait, wait, we'll go to John 20 in the next next one. Um, sure. But uh, th thanks for that, Pibisis. Um Tyler, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think uh, the Biblicist uh, hit the nail on the head. There we go. And if you want to go John 20, 28, we'll go there uh, next. And the argument is Jesus is never called God, right? But I don't know, Unitarians are a bit confused with it. Oh, I thought David is God because he's king of Israel. I thought uh, Moses is God, you know, Exodus 7.1. Exodus 4, 16. Um, I thought they are God, right? But then they say Jesus is never called God, and I'm not sure. Um, but Mike, uh, why don't you clarify this one a little bit? Yeah, sure. The idea is that in the sense of the Father, as God Almighty, Je Jesus is never explicitly stated as that. Now, when you show them verses like John 20, 28, they'll the way that they interpret the passages are different. So the passages in which I would say he actually is, um, the interpretations, they'll find a loophole, whether it's a manuscript variant or uh, an interpretation, there's always some way out. So um, it's basically the idea that he's not, and then you'll, yeah, we know that he's not the father, um, but the idea that they'll use is that Jesus is never referred to as the almighty God. That's the idea. So the verses where Moses is, or where Satan, even Satan, the devil is called the God of this world, um, or where angels or judges are referred to as God. It's not the one true God. Now the problem lies then, well, I'll leave it at that. I'll let you guys talk. Yeah. It's okay. Um, all right, so I have John twenty twenty eight here. This is let's let's go to that. Um, he's called God here, apparently, right? What do you say, people? This you you wanted to go John? Sorry, I was just muted. Okay. That's okay. So, so if we could just uh, go to the context of this verse, we'll just go John twenty completely. 
Because over here, we could just say he's both God and man, because that's the objection we are answering. Yep. 100% God and 100% man. Yep, we can ask that too. Just for the benefit of these anti Trinitarians and for those who want to hear. Hmm. Okay, Thanks. so yeah, from 24. So, you know, this is about a week after Jesus' resurrection. All the disciples, but Thomas haven't seen him, and he wasn't believing that. So now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So Jesus said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my fingers into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Okay. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the, stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side, to not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now, if Jesus wasn't man, why was Thomas asking to look into the, to his wounds, to believe that? And then Jesus came over there and he told them, Come on, just touch, touch me. Prove that I'm not a ghost. I'm not some kind of a spirit. Hmm. So he's both God and man over here. That objection just goes out of the window. And one more verse. Yep. Just one more verse. Just to sharpen. Is it Psalm 35? Uh, rebuke it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's Psalm a Psalm 35 parallel. That'll be Psalm 35 verse 23. If I'm not wrong. So the, so the phrase, my Lord and my God, just to alert you guys here, it's never used for anyone uh, other than God himself in the Old Testament. Praise my Lord and my God. 20, 35, 23, right? Yeah, it was 23. Yep. It's just the reverse over here. Yeah. To my cause, my God and my Lord. And if you are reading the Greek variant of this, it just actually translates to the God of me and the Lord of me. Whereas in John 20, 28, the Greek reads, the Lord of me and the God of me, Kyrios and then Theos. Over here, it's, uh, over here it's Ha Theos, and after that, it is Ha Kyrios. Yeah, and this is not the, the name of God, right? My Lord here is Adoni, right? Oh, yep. Yeah, it's, it's not yep. Jehovah, right? Yeah, it's yeah, not. There's no, there's it's, no all it's not capital, because... Verse 22, yeah. it's Yahweh or Jehovah in verse 22, but over here it's just Adonai or Kyrios in the Greek. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, Tyler, do you have any more to add from this? You're muted, Tyler. Uh, uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, uh, just three things. First of all, as you guys have pointed out, it is not true that Jesus is never referred to as God. He's referred to as God in like, half a dozen different verses or something like that. Like, you know, the, the, the uh, name of the, the word God specifically is attributed to him. So, the, so that's the first point. Secondly, he is called God in other ways. Like he is called the Lord, you know, the Lord of Lords, the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, he's called the, uh, he's called the author of life, for example. And, you know, so he's called many other things which indicate that he's. <laughs> there was a dog. Sounded deadly. <laughs> that's, Satan, that's Satan trying to silence us. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Are you there still, Tyler? Uh, he's he's gone. That's okay. Um, there's one way that he's called God. Uh, he, you don't need for him to be explicitly called God, but things that are attributes to God, the prerogatives of God, right? Um, let me just go to Colossians one and Hebrews one, and then we'll we will also we also went to. Uh, Psalms chapter 2 just now. So that's one way he's called God. 
by alluding to the Old Testament text that he's called God. But the doctrine of creation is attributed to God. It, no one else created uh, the heavens and the earth, right? Only God did, unless those Unitarians want to say the angels as well, um, which is a heresy, by the way. Um, no one thinks a an angel created us. But uh, Colossians 1 uh, and Hebrews 1. We'll go to Colossians 1 first. Uh, since we wanted to touch on that uh, prior to this. Colossians 1, 15 to 17 or 18, all right? He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, right? Where the thrones of dominions of principalities of powers, all things were created through him and for him he is before all things and in him all things consist and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence tyler you're back do you have anything to say about this one since we want to talk about this uh yeah yeah well i, I just wanted to bring up my final point uh really yeah. quickly uh i just wanted to say that even if jesus even if they accepted that Jesus is, ref is referred to as God. Like even if Jesus said word for word, I am God, they would not accept it because the angel of the Lord says word for word, I am God. And they don't believe the angel of the Lord is God. So it really doesn't matter anyways, because they're just going to find a loophole. Yep. Yeah. They'll say it's the agent as the agent. Yeah. And, I, and you know, if I could, Jeremy, really quick too, um, in that scripture in, in Colossians in 15, uh, a big re rebuke, what I would say, or what I used to say, is where it says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and visible, and then highlight this point, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And so a Unitarian will say, well, hold on. It doesn't say the mountains, the trees, the valleys, the oceans. So it's talking about something else. It's not talking about the Genesis creation. And you can say, well, and this is something that I said in the chat really quick. Well, hold on now, because if you go to Romans chapter 13, um, verse 1, it says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which is from God. God is the maker of these authorities. And so now, even if it's not speaking about Genesis, even if, I think it is, but even if you use that as your argument, it still falls into the idea that it is still God who sets these powers into place. So there's still issues there. And I think if you take the idea, I think it's a it's a bad place to be in as a Unitarian because ultimately they conceptualize Jesus as at least a God, one who is immortal, one who is in heaven, one who is a hearer of all prayer. Meaning, so now he's omnipresent, um, one who has all rule and authority. Whether or not he's given that doesn't matter. He still has all rule and authority. What else would you call that? But at least a God. And then, then, then we get into the idea of Arianism. So usually the next step of Unitarianism, the easiest step, is Arianism. It's the most natural next step if you just take that thought all the way through, um, which we know also is heresy. So uh, that's basically... All I have to say. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. And I also have one more passage to go to, which um, our brother Chris Claus in the chat has alluded to. Uh, so we, I didn't want to go to Romans chapter 13. We trust your, your interpretation of that. But in Hebrews 1 as well, uh, I think you guys can hear something in the background, but that's okay. In Hebrews 1, is it is it bad? Is it yep, bad? I can see I can see Hebrews one. Oh, but is the sound so maybe, bad? It's okay. It's not that bad. It's not that it's bad. It's okay. okay. It's all right. Cool. Hi, William Albrecht. William Albrecht in the chat as well. God bless you. Um yeah, so in Hebrews one, uh let's go to verse eight, right? I mean, just just skip to verse eight for now. A lot of Unitarians try to butcher this, but if you read it properly, right, it's the the father who's saying these things, okay. Uh, let's not go to 1.8. Let's go to verse 5, all right? For which of the angels did he ever say he is the father? You are my son. 
today I have begotten you, right? No doubt is the father speaking here, right? He's he's quoting Psalm 2 7 here. And again, it's no doubt is the father. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn to the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So it's natural that the father is speaking, right? So when the father speaks here in verse 8, but to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Well, if Unitarians want to say this quote is to the Father, but in verse 9, if, if, if it's the Father, then the Father has a God. That doesn't make sense to uh, that doesn't make sense to Trinitarianism, more so Unitarianism, right? And also, if if it's about the Son, that's that makes perfect sense with Trinitarianism because the Son became flesh and God is a God of all flesh. You can see that from the book of Jeremiah. But let's go back to the creation narrative again. Uh, Hebrews 1, before that, uh, over here, um, we, we see in verse uh, verse 2, uh, verse 1 and 2, let yep. me read, read all of it. God, and this will segue to our other points as well. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets. He has in these days, last days, spoken to us by his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, through whom... Also, he made the worlds. All right. Um, I'm not sure whether this this will tell us anything. Uh, put note. Eons. There we go. He Eons. made the ages. He made the times. Right. So this will segue to Jesus's pre-human existence. Okay. Not only Jesus created all these thrones, dominions, authorities. He also created time, the ages the eons okay so let me go to back to the point here our last point was jesus is never called god we have we have ultimate out we have decimated that point already so the next point here jesus did not exist before his birth all right mike do you have anything to add from here right yeah so the idea here is expressed in for example matthew um, where it's spoken of as the beginning of Jesus Christ, or the uh, the actual word is the genesis, the genesis of Jesus Christ, um, the starting point of Jesus Christ. And so a Unitarian will say, how can how can a person pre-exist himself? That doesn't make any sense. Um, with when denying the idea of a pre-human existence, um, so the idea that they'll use is. The, the narrative that we're presented in the Gospels is consistently portrayed as Jesus Christ, the man, which is true, began in the womb of Mary, denying, denying, however, the pre-human existence. Yep, thanks, Mike. Uh, I already shown you in Hebrews 1 uh, that Jesus created the time, so he can't, he of course exists before that before his birth. Um, but anyone, uh, maybe Biblicist, you haven't spoken for a while. What do you say about this uh, objection? So just to begin with, if he didn't exist before his birth, if you just go to John's gospel, the prologue, the very prologue. John 1, yep, and you'll have to zoom in, scroll down, the eternal word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, not a God, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, there is no indefinite article in the Greek, there's no a God, and the word was God, he was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that nothing was made that was made okay in him was life and the life was the light of men 
and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So it's talking about a word of God, who is the same as God. All creation was made by him, through him. Nothing in existence exists without him. Okay, so let's go now. And it's also saying that it's the true light, the true life. There's a lot of parallel here with Genesis 1, but I'm not going into that because that's deep stuff, not today. Then verse 6 goes on to say about John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So again, echoing Malachi 3. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Okay, now, who is this true light? Uh, if he's read verses 4 and 5, this is the word of God. Now, he was in the world, and the light shines in the darkness. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay? So, he was not that light, that is, John was in that light. Now, it's talking about Jesus in verse 10. Or rather the word of God. I haven't said it's Jesus yet. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. So this word of God created the world. He came to his own, that is his own people, the Jews, and his own did not receive him. But as many has received him, to him he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now this next sentence, that's important. The word becomes flesh from verse 14. And the word became flesh, this eternal word existing before all ages, before all time, became flesh by the Holy Spirit and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And uh, there you go. Jesus pre-existed. He created everything, invisible and invisible. The other parallel verses for this are, say, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul Shema. You could say the Christian Shema. And the other parallel for this is uh, Colossians 1, verses 15 to 19. Even over there, it speaks about Jesus creating everything, whether it's invisible invis or visible, everything. So there you go. Jesus existed eternally. It's only his human nature started existing after the incarnation. His human nature was formed by the Holy Spirit, if you read Matthew and Luke. There you go. Right. Thanks, Publicist. Tyler, do you have anything to add? Uh, uh, so, so what was the uh, topic of this slide again? Uh, Jesus did not pre-exist before his birth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that just, I do think that that is definitely the weakest or one of the weakest points of Sicinian Unitarianism. It's like, you know, at least Arians accept that Jesus pre-existed. I, I think it is just beyond absurd to say that he did not exist beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, he is, he is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. He's the author of life. How, how can he be called the author of life if he did not exist like like like, like if, if if other life existed before him how can he be the author of life right so uh, th that's all i have to say to that, about that okay thanks for that um i have a few verses here um and i'm gonna get it up uh, but mike do you have anything to add as well yeah um in regards to john 1 1 there's a lot of problems with the unitarian with with the multiple Unitarian interpretations. One of the signs you know that a system of belief is not true is if they're not um, consistent. And there are many interpretations of John 1-1 among Unitarians. And I think it's important for the public to know this, so everyone in the chat. There's not just one way a Unitarian interprets John 1-1, or John 1, the whole chapter. You'll have a scholar like Anthony Buzzard, his view, it is speaking about Genesis creation. Um, the word is an it, it's not a he. Um, the word is the God is God's plan that he's always had in mind, which he used to create everything. You'll have another scholar like Bill Schlegel, who says it's not talking about Genesis creation, it's talking about the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And the word is Jesus. 
And it's speaking of how everything is, is starting fresh, is starting new in the ministry. Two very contradictory interpretations. Both, both are Unitarian. Um, both fervent Unitarians that Unitarians often refer to, both scholars. Um, and so there is no there is no single Unitarian interpretation of John 1. And that's a big problem. Um, you know, there's, there is a lot of problems when studying John 1, looking at the history, looking at the context of language uh, to deny the preexistent person, hood, the personhood of the word. Uh, that's all I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. And just, just to add on a few things here, um, even if they don't like, I mean, they try to butcher John 1 or the creation narrative for Jesus, at least um, to Paul and Jude, uh, he actually was active in the Old Testament, right? So I have a few verses here, 1 Corinthians 10, um, talking about temptation, uh, being tempted. Um, and over here, we see, uh, let's let's read uh, from verse 1 to 4, right? Um, For I do not want you to be aware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. All right, it's talking about the, the exodus here. And all passed through the sea, right? No doubt it's the exodus. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, right? Moses, that's the Old Testament here, right? And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, right? And they drank from the spiritual rock right it's not an inanimate object because it has because this rock followed them for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was christ it's not the father the rock was christ right and then it goes on to say why uh, these guys also tempt christ right uh verse six now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did to not be idolaters as some of them were, right? Still talking about the, the Israelites in the wilderness. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. How can they tempt Christ if, you know, Christ did not pre-exist? before becoming flesh, right? Supposedly, he become flesh at 0 AD. This is way before that, right? Or 1 AD, all right? Um, if you guys have not, nothing to add, I have I also Hebrews 11 also talking about Moses, right? By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called son of the Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of who? Christ, greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. How can he consider the reproach of Christ if Christ haven't existed then? And then one more last verse. I chose the ESV, and Biblicists will touch on it a little bit as well. Uh, but the ESV uh, says, says this in Jude 5. Now I want to remind you, again, it's, it's in the Exodus. I want to remind you, although... You once fully knew it, all right? They knew as well that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed by those who did not believe, right? Uh, Biblicist, why don't you touch on this a little bit on the manuscript? Okay, so now what people, critical scholars, want to argue was the word over here wasn't actually Jesus. It talked about the Lord or God. So it could have been the Father. And uh, due to liberal scholarship, yeah, the, the Lord who once saved. So then it becomes unclear whether this was, this is, is it actually talking about Jesus or is it actually talking about the Father? But we have older manuscripts, the earliest known witness of Jude, which records Jude verse 5, this particular verse. It's called Papyrus 72 or P72, and it dates to around 200 to 250 AD. That reading has Jesus. That's the earliest known witness. So it's over the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. These are the manuscripts from which we have made much of our modern Bibles today. And those manuscripts need to be 
taken with a grain of salt. Just because they were complete Bibles, it doesn't re- necessarily mean that they were, the scribes did a really good job because they came from the Alexandrian tradition. Hmm. Okay. Uh, but, but this is why don't you give a relative kind of, uh, you know, how early other manuscripts are that we use today? How early you know? in, in yeah, what so sense? How early is, is 200 to 250 AD early? It's, or late? it's very it's very early it's very early yeah okay it's very early okay guys um but even though we, if we don't want to go to talk about manuscript tradition the context we'll talk has 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 spoken about who the lord is all right even though if jesus here is replaced by the lord the context in verse four shows that the lord is also jesus here jesus. so whatever you want to talk about you know, whether the manuscript traditions, um, you know, pretending to know the manuscript traditions, I I don't know fully yet. But reading the context, you see the Lord is Jesus Christ. Okay. And I think there's uh, a variant yep. reading for Jude 1, 4, but it actually, instead of saying master, yeah. I think it says God and Savior. If I'm not yeah, sure, that's, there's a that's variant the, reading for this. Yeah. Okay. Then we have to go to another variant manuscript yeah. tradition. But uh, I, I know the King James put Lord God. Um, that's perfectly fine. It still says Lord Jesus as well, right? So both of them are called Lord, right? Which is not which is sound Trinitarianism. Both are Lord, both are God, right? Um, Tyler, do you have anything more to add? Oh, I think he already spoke. Uh, Mike, do you have any more to add from this? If no, you guys, to you guys touched it really well. Because I was just going to bring out, even if it is Lord in five, the context is clearly speaking of jesus as the lord in verse four so that's all yeah you guys did really well right no thank you for giving us these points to refute but uh thank god that you have come out of it um if not we won't have this uh live stream as well but uh let's if i'm just looking at the time um do you guys still have time for maybe three more points yeah I have all the time in the world. The world, okay. The world that Jesus created, right? Um, but uh, okay, let's let's go to let's go to one more point of Jesus. Okay, there's a lot of points of Jesus here. Um, it says Jesus is not Almighty. This uh, this might be a long one. That's why I was hesitating to go go to it or not. But uh, we can take the whole live stream. Uh, take the whole you know maybe half an hour or uh, fifteen minutes on this. But uh, let's not go too much. All right, Jesus is not Almighty. And some sub points here. He does not know the day or, or the hour. That's a good uh, go-to text as well. Can be tempted. Mark one. He tem- he was tempted in the wilderness, and he was given authority to rule. Acts two thirty six. Um, it says uh, God made him both um, Lord and Christ. Right. He was given authority to be Lord. Uh, Mike, do you have anything to add from here? Yeah. So these are verses that 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 we would use a lot. Um, to refute that Jesus is omnipresent or has all or knows everything, um, just like he doesn't know the day or the hour, or he has to receive power, he has to receive glory, um, these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, Tyler, why don't we start from you? Do you have anything to, to add from this one? All right, uh, uh, I'll let uh, one of you guys tackle the first two points. I just want to tackle the third point. So about Jesus being given authority to rule, uh, that, that, that doesn't mean that Jesus never had authority. Uh, first of all, uh, the fact is Jesus limited himself when he became a human being. He emptied himself when he became a human being. And he did not use his equal his equality with God to his advantage, and so then he became glorified. The Father glorified him, and uh, so yeah, he was given authority uh, back to him after he had limited himself as a human being. You could say that, but uh, a point I want to bring up is that in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, it says that Jesus will give the kingdom to God the Father. So. It says after all things have, um, you know, it's like it's talking about the, the, the end times after the end times and all of that. Jesus will give the kingdom to God. So he is giving authority over the kingdom to God. So uh, so that 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 
even if you even if you want to say, oh, well, he didn't limit himself or whatever. The the point is, Jesus and and the Father can give each other authority and glory and exalt each other and stuff like that because they are equal. Uh, thanks for that, um, kind of Biblicis. I'll set this one out at the moment. But okay. given authority to rule, and but I can tackle that second objections that Jesus can be tempted. Yep. Okay, so to make a case for this, we got to understand that Jesus can be tempted in his human nature as man. Why do I say that? If you're going to Jeremiah 32 37, Jeremiah 32. 37 and verse number 37 specifically i wonder how the esv renders it because i usually stick to okay. new king james yeah scroll down yep just a second did i get the right verse just a minute i think i might be a bit off here 32 right yeah, just a sec, I might be a bit off over here. Sorry, it's Jeremiah 32, 27, my bad. Yeah, no worries. Okay, 27. Is it God of all flesh? Yes, behold, I am Jehovah, that's capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Now, see... God says he's the God of all flesh. Now, the thing about Jesus is if you're reading the prologue of John in John 1, 14, he actually, the word, the eternal word, who is God, comes down and, and becomes flesh. He incarnates as flesh in his human nature. So in his human nature, he is subject to the Father. And in the human nature, he's flesh. He can be tempted by his human nature, but not by his divine nature. So that's one way of, say, tackling the objection. And also, uh, Tyler was talking about 1 Corinthians 15, that all creation needs will be subject to the Father, that once Christ has put all his enemies under his feet, everything will be subject to the Father. That's all creation. So since Christ has become part of all creation, he has become part of flesh due to his incarnation. So as man, he could be tempted. Yep. As God, he can't be tempted. Yep. That's that's good. I'll I'll tackle the, the first point here. And uh well it's it's not what I, I came up with. Um Anthony Rogers is a beast um in apologetics. He came he, even he didn't come up with it, he made it uh known to us. Um I think it was Augustine who who talked about that. Um but first of all before we get to that, if no one knows the day or the hour, even the sun, we can use the same point Biblicis made. He became flesh. Okay, that's the traditional interpretation of this verse here, right? Mark 12, Mark 13, 32. Uh, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even angels heaven, nor the sun, but only the father. But um, Anthony Rogers, um, not that I'm appealing to authority, I'm appealing to his argument here, right? The word know here is more like make known, okay? Uh, if, you know, if you know Hebrew, the word know can be used as uh, sexual intercourse as well. Um, but it also can be used as make known. Uh, what do I mean? In 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, uh, Paul says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Christ Jesus and him crucify it's a bit maybe it's a bit new to you guys um but what does paul mean does does paul mean i don't want to know anything about you except jesus uh and him crucified is it some cognitive if this this uh phrase uh this word know here means some cognitive uh knowledge here of course not it's it's more like i'm determined not to declare or make known anything among you except jesus christ and him crucified so if we use this know here and uh, use that for Mark 13.32, that makes sense now. 
right? Even if Jesus in his divine nature, he knows, but it's not his prerogative to make it known, right? He's not the, the one who declared it, it's the Father, right? Um, in Acts chapter 1, we see the apostles talking to Jesus here, okay? And this will in, this soundly interprets what uh, Anthony Rogers or Augustine interprets it, right? Therefore, when they had come together, uh, verse 6 to 7, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, right? I said just now the word no no here uh, in Mark chapter 13 and 1 Corinthians 2 2 is make known. In this verse here, it's the Father who is the one who has the prerogative to make known the time, the, the end times. Okay. So that's how we tackle uh, Mark 13 32 or uh, parallels in, in uh, Matthew and uh, Luke. But um, we don't want to go too deep on that. Uh, but uh, I think we soundly uh, refute that. Uh, Mike, uh, anything more to add? From this yeah, point? I would say you're exactly right. This discussion you could spend a lot of time on. And I think it's foolish to come to the come to this um, as a Unitarian, you know, posing these questions without thinking, how, how has 2,000 years gone by without these questions ever being asked before? And they have been. There's plenty of um, church father works on these passages. Um, some of them taking one road, some of them another, but usually dismissing the Gnostic view of these verses. But never is there a view that is a biblical Unitarian view of the church fathers. You'll never find an argument that... Um, until 16th century is interpreted the way that a biblical Unitarian interpret, interprets these. So I think it would be cool to do another video where we tackle just this, mm -hmm. maybe in the future. Um, but uh, I think being, a, being humble and doing study, doing your own study and looking into what other great men like Augustine, like you mentioned Augustine, what they have to say about these verses, because they're good questions to raise when we're studying, good questions that are not that naturally arise when we read these scriptures. It's good to go back and see what what is the, the questions that have already been asked before, see what the answers have been before. So hmm. yes, thanks for that, Mike. Um Biblis, your mic was unmuted. Do you have anything to add? No? Oh no, nothing at this point. Okay. Mark All right, so let's done. yeah, let's let's head on to the Holy Spirit. We have only one point on the Holy Spirit, um, but the Holy Spirit needs to be uh, has you need more points for the Holy Spirit next time. But uh, the Holy Spirit is shy in the New Testament. Mike, what do you mean by shy? Yeah, so a phrase that they like to say is it's the shyest person of the Trinity, meaning that he's never he never comes in any greetings. Like Paul and the apostles never say, we we greet you in the name of the Holy Spirit or things like that. Um, he never actually speaks words. Um, and he's referred less, much considerably less than Jesus Christ and the Father. So that's the idea. They, they'll say, if the Holy Spirit is almighty, why is he rarely referred to? when compared to Jesus Christ and the Father. Well, right off the bat, I would say the Holy Spirit is inspiring the text. So he he says all the things. Uh, I mean, the 66 books, or maybe all more books, right? If you are uh, different faith traditions, he inspires those scriptures, right? Um, but um, Tyler, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, they'll argue that the Holy Spirit is quote unquote too shy. They'll say that the Holy Spirit is not mentioned enough, which I think the Holy Spirit is mentioned a lot in the New Testament, especially uh, not as much as the Father and Son. But I mean, using using that logic, you could say that that Jesus is shy because 
because uh, the father is referred to more than Jesus. Because I, 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 th- I think there's like maybe, uh, I, th- I think the, 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 I think the term the father is is used more in the New Testament. Like I think like fifty or hundred times more than the son is. So you can say, oh well, the, the son is shy. You, you can't really do a comparative analysis like that. You can't say. Oh, well, you know, the Holy Spirit is shy just because he's referred to less. That 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 makes no sense. And but uh, and Mike also brought up that they did not that uh, Paul did not mention the Holy Spirit in his greetings, and that's just an argument from silence. They'll say, "Oh, the Holy Spirit is not mentioned in this particular verse, therefore he must not be God." But there's verses like, for example, if you go to Colossians, there's a passage where it says, "Do not serve men." serve only the lord and the lord that you are serving is jesus christ it does not mention the father or the holy spirit so according to that logic the father must be shy and the father must not be as important as jesus because it says serve the lord jesus and doesn't specifically mention the father uh so yeah it's it's not a very good argument you can't just say that something is mentioned less therefore it's not as important the fact is, if something is mentioned even once in Scripture, it is it is important. If, if it's just mentioned one time in the entire Scripture, it's important. Thanks for that, Tyler. Um, before we go go to that again, uh, Mike, why don't you clarify uh, what do Unitarians think of who the Holy Spirit is? All right. Again, there's multiple there's multiple views. Um. Some of them say that it's just the power of God. So it's a force. It's an it. It's not a he. Um, They'll try to say, well, it's not impersonal. It's a personal force or power. I'm not sure how that, I I honestly don't know how how they work that out. But um, another view is it is God. It's speaking that the Holy Spirit is God. It's It's the spirit that is holy. So it's the Father. It's another it's, it's interchangeable with the Father. Um, so there's multiple views. Sometimes, like, uh, like I'll be honest, I personally went back and forth. I wasn't quite sure what I believed on it with the Holy Spirit. It's something that is very uh, ambiguous. Um, some passages are clear that it's speaking of a person. Other passages, not so much. Other passages are interpreted as... As a Unitarian, as this is just the force, it's the the power of God. Um, so that's that's kind of the viewpoint. There's multiple views again on what the Holy Spirit is, and you'll see them argue sometimes back and forth on what on what it means. You mean they argue among themselves? Yeah, just like they'll argue with John one one. They'll arg- they'll argue about uh, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they don't even have a sound. I mean, a firm doctrine of who the Holy Spirit is which tells you something about them, right? Um, again, this is not, I, I didn't mention it, but it's not to belittle them. We want them to know the truth, right? But I mean, if you, if you want to, if you, they want to say all these things, um, their, their foundation is not firm enough, right? Especially on the Holy Spirit. And they, they even tell us that Holy Spirit is shy. Even to them, uh, their, th- their theology is shy, right? Um, but uh, anyway, Biblicist, do you have anything to add before I go into what I have? So, yeah, like as Mike was saying about this personification, they just can't agree. Some of them say it's some kind of a force, like mm-hmm. Star Wars, it's a personal force or an impersonal force. And yeah, you have all the passages here, most of them. And in addition mm-hmm. to the passages here, we have other passages like uh, in Acts 10, Peter was saying that the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And in Revelation 22, the very last chapter of the Bible, the spirit and the bride are both saying come to the feast at the end at the very end when all is said is done the second coming and then you have pulled over the some other passages so yeah you could just go ahead and go through them yeah so um if the holy spirit is shy um and he i don't not sure does he the day say that he doesn't speak at all yeah we'll say that he doesn't speak at all okay let's only refute that um, first of all, he is he can be lied to, verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, uh, let, me, let me zoom in a little bit more. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land 
for yourself. So Holy Spirit can be lied to. In verse 9, he can be tested. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look at the feet of those who have buried your husbands are at the door and they will carry you out. All right? So it can lie to, it can be tested. It's not just a force, right? A force can't be lied to, can't be tested. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't speak, let me go to verse Acts 13, verse 1 to 4. Right? I'll just read this to you and see, see what you say. Um, now in the church that was in, at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas Simeon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, he sent them away. Right? So the Holy Spirit speaks here. Right? It's explicit here. Uh, I don't know how they're going to get around this one. Uh, but in verse 4, the Holy Spirit uh, sends as well, just like God sends people. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there, they sailed to Cyprus. All right, another verse to show that the Holy Spirit speaks. And thank uh, our brother, uh, Sam Shamoon, who provided his article on this one. Um, not sure whether article or his session, because I, I wrote it down uh, based on his what he, he found. So in Acts 16, 6 to 7, then when they had gone through Phrygia and the regions of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. The Holy Spirit forbids them. And after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit did not permit them. All right. This this does one up one better than the, the, the Holy Spirit is not being greeted. Here, the Holy Spirit is active, right? And it's, there's verbs ascribed to him, right? Um, but yeah, um, in Hebrews 10 as well, not only the New Testament, so so some of you uh, Orthodox Jews might say, well, Hebrews 10 is, a, is, a, is, is New Testament. But uh, in Hebrews 10, verse 15, right? Uh, the writer here, uh, or I'll call him Paul, uh, in verse 15, it says, but the Holy Spirit, also witnesses to us for after he had said before all right he has said this in the old testament i think it's in jeremiah in verse 16 this is the covenant that i'll make with them for after those days says the lord i'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds i will write them then he adds all right then he adds is not in the greek but it's still the same quotation their sins and lawless deeds i will remember no more now there is remission of this. There is no longer an offering for sin. So the Holy Spirit does speak in the Old Testament as well, not only in the New Testament. And the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 23, verse 2 to 3, the Holy Spirit speaks through David. And he, is also, he, also, he was also called the God of Israel. We're not going to go to that. 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 to 3. 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 to 3. Um. I also have one more to add. This one was brought to my attention quite recently um, by Brother Sam, who is who also cited a work from, uh, if William Albrecht is still here, um, William Albrecht, uh, you know, the, the father, uh, Father Carpus, not the Father Carpus, Father Carpus, his name is, he, he mentioned that Philippians chapter 3, verse 3 is usually mistranslated in most modern English Bibles here. Right, and if Unitarians would like want to say the Holy Spirit is not being worshipped to, uh, let's see Philippians three three in the interlinear here. Let me zoom in a little bit. So Father Carpus has written an article, uh, which God willing I will uh, put it uh, in the description box or the comments later. Um, but here, right, Philippians three three, we are we you know it's 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 literal so we can't uh, make some sense in here but in ver in this uh the word here pneumati right that's spirit to you spirit of god so that's the holy spirit right 
worshipping. We worship the Holy Spirit. The word, the usual translation is those who worship in spirit. But the problem is in is here, right? In, right? But in in the previous text, right? Before that, there's no in, right? I don't know why Bible Hub would put in here. In is not there, right? Literally, it means those who worship the Spirit of God. And uh, thank Father Kappas who uh, pointed that out. Uh, he's a great uh, Greek scholar as well. Um, any more things to add, guys? Yeah, I just want to say these are amazing points, Jeremy. Um, you know, because then, but one of one of the things that they'll say is the ones that take the side that the Holy Spirit is the Father, right? Yep. So they'll use verses like this to show that it is the Father. It's not a force. It's not the power. But you'll they'll use these verses to those those who take this view. They'll use these verses to prove that it is speaking of the Father. And I I already know <laughs> off, right off the back back of my head or the top of my head, I should say, that there are verses that distinguish the Holy Spirit from the Father. For example, that we're to be baptized in the name of the Father, comma, the Son, comma, and the Holy Spirit. So I would say right off the bat, great points, Jeremy, for, for proving that the Holy Spirit is indeed a person who can speak and do all these other things. And then that leaves you in an awkward position then as a Unitarian to prove, well, then then who is the Holy Spirit? Is it the Father? And yet there's verses that uh, differentiate. Do you know any, any more verses that differentiate between the, the Holy Spirit and the Father? So yeah, that would be, yeah, John 14, Germany's brought it up. And also John 16, where Jesus clearly differentiates between himself, the Father, and the Holy Spirit as three different beings. I mean, three different persons of beings. It doesn't get any clearer than that. I mean, John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you Perfect. forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him, neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells in you and will be in you, right? Um, Tyler, I think you have more points, right? I've seen you uh, comment yeah. before. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, John sixteen thirteen says that the Holy Spirit does not speak of Himself, but only speaks what the Father tells Him to. This makes no sense if the Holy Spirit is the Father. Sixteen thirteen. Let's get it up so that they they don't think we are misquoting it. Sixteen thirteen. Uh, sixteen thirteen. Chapter sixteen, verse thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. When the Spirit of Truth comes. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Yep. Uh, any more to add? Otherwise, we will close with one more point, and then that's, that's two hours. Yep. All right, so we soundly show that the Bible does teach the doctrine of the Trinity. And um, maybe we'll, we'll put this in another point. Uh, we'll have another brother who's going to come to us, uh, who's going to talk about the church fathers. But another thing for you guys in the, in the chat to think about, uh, this is a common objection, the Council of Nicaea, right? The famous, famous Council of Nicaea that Unitarians, even Muslims will use, that the Trinity is not even formulated by them. Um, Mike, why don't you clarify a bit to the audience and then we'll probably close from here. We don't going to answer right. this. Yeah, so just kind of like an introduction to the mindset. Um, and there's multiple views to this, but a common uneducated view is that the Trinity didn't exist before the Council of Nicaea in 325. And then a bunch of men got together and they came up, they came up with this doctrine in 325 and it only started then and then because these these men came to that decision the rest of history um, was in the books and if you went against it you were persecuted these kinds of things um, but the common misconception is that the trinity started at the council of nicaea or the idea of it 
uh, we know that that idea is, is easily refuted with a little study of history. Um, but I'll let you guys speak on that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe we don't talk too much about it. Uh, just say one sentence or two about it and then we'll, we'll, um, tease the audience to, for a second part. Yeah. Just one more thing. They say that Christianity was legalized by Constantine and that's why the Christianity we know today was made up. Just to tell you the truth, the Arian bishops were in the majority at the Council of Nicaea and Constantine, FYI, was backing the Arians. Okay. That's all I can say for now. Sure. Thanks. Hi. Yeah, so I think it is absurd to say that because uh, they are suggesting that Christians had no concept of a trinity before the Council of Nicaea. And so they're suggesting that the, that all the Christians just rolled over and just accepted this brand new doctrine, but they had pr uh, persevered in their faith in the face of bloody and relentless persecution for centuries. Earlier in the fourth century, you know, Diocletian was brutally persecuting Christians. So they stood the, they stood firm in their beliefs. So wh why would they just roll over and just give up all of a sudden when they had been standing so firm in their beliefs for centuries? Thank you, Tyler. I mean, these guys were had the traditions of the apostles, right? They, you can trace back their tradition back to the apostles themselves. But the Unitarians, um, correct me if I'm wrong, they are, their doctrine, I mean, their theology only started in the 1600s. Is that right, Mike? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you want to count numbers like that, uh, let's say 381, Trinity was established. For them, that's 1,600 years later. If you want to count numbers, uh, we are not into counting numbers, but uh, but we already shown from the Bible, uh, the Trinity doctrine is there, as we have shown before, okay? Um, so I think that's, that's all that we have for the materials. Uh, any last words from you guys? Uh, let's start from Tyler. Uh, I just want to say that every single Unitarian argument against the deity of Christ, either all they're doing is they're either A, proving that Jesus is a man, B, proving that Jesus limited himself, or C, proving that Jesus is not the Father. They don't actually provide any verses that say Jesus isn't God. They just provide verses that, that say Jesus is distinct from the Father and that he became subject to the Father when he became a man. Thanks, Tyler. A lot of straw manning here. Uh, Biblicist. Any last words? No, nothing. I hope this session edified everyone. That what we can see is like people just want like to quote my scripture and predicate their own theology, their own false doctrines. So whenever you take scripture, you need to consider it in totality and take note of teachers who have been studying the traditions passed down right from the apostles, if you want to int interpret scripture in a sound way. Otherwise, as Mike was saying, that Unitarians have got different views about the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is what's just going to happen if everybody's just going to just pick courses which they like and then think that they have become theologians or something like that. <laughs> Quote Mike. Hebrew scholars and Greek scholars. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bibsis. Mike, any last words? Yeah, yeah. I just want to thank you so much for having us. I, I really enjoyed it. I hope other people enjoyed it as well. Um, and I will see the, the, the big danger in the, the mind that I had before. It was a very arrogant mind. It was basically thinking I can open up the Bible and come to my own interpretation. Um, and that can be very dangerous. Um, I think one of the big problems facing God's church today or the Christianity today, there's many interpretations. And if we if we could just take a step back and say, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, I, maybe I'm not interpreting interpreting this right. How did they interpret it before? How did they... You know, we are constantly told uh, in the scriptures, Jesus said, I will never forsake you. I will always be with you until the end. Um, 
as, as with the spirit of the truth, will never leave us. So if that was true, if the spirit of truth never left, then that that uh, distributes an incredible problem with the biblical Unitarian view, with the Unitarian view that propped up in the 16th century. That means all that time, the spirit of truth was lost, and Jesus wasn't with them. All that time, they were in darkness. Um, so if we take a step back and tr and just and prayerfully meditate on that know, and know that Jesus Christ never left us. Maybe something's wrong with my interpretation. Maybe, maybe I'm just not looking at this right. Um, and I pray that we all do that um, in the end. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And we will pray for you as you uh, continue to learn the Trinitarian faith, the true faith, and in the Catholic, Catholic catechism. Right. Um, but yeah, so if you guys want to see more, we'll definitely do a part two. There's definitely uh, more people who wants to come on. Uh, I have at least two people who wants to come on, uh, which, which we thank uh, God for, for having these brothers being here. So thank you, Blipsis, Tyler, and especially Mike touch. for being here. Sorry. Touch, thank you all. Just touch. No worries. No Tyler, worries. Uh, be sure to like, clearly. be sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell. Uh, hit the reminder bell when you see the live stream coming on and we'll see you uh, next time. God bless. God bless you all. God bless you. Bye. Ciao.